Uh, today, I'm excited to have Katie Cross with us. She is a best selling fantasy author and also a multi genre author who writes about strong heroines who don't need a man to save them, which is awesome. <laughs> and she's also an indie author who coaches writers on how to uncover uh, the vision for their next goal and the hidden challenges that may be sabotaging their career. And you can find more about Katie at KC kcrosswriting.com. Uh, so uh, glad to have you here, Katie. This is so fun to chat. Yeah, this is going to be great. I always love chatting. Awesome. Well, uh, I, I actually remember when, when uh, I first uh, met you online years ago. <laughs> yes. And I was working on my, oh, I think I just finished actually my first book. I think that's what it was, my first historical romance. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, uh, Katie, you were, you were nice enough to offer to review my book. And you know what, yeah. honestly, it was the most helpful three star review I've ever had because <laughs> it helped me to understand what areas I needed to work on, right? To get better as an author. And so thank you for that. Hopefully, hopefully that wasn't a three star review. That was like, I was totally being a jerk. Oh. <laughs> I do remember you <laughs> took the feedback so well that, and you were so gracious about it that I, I actually did a blog post about how well you took the feedback, like just targeting, uh, you know, you were just very open and you weren't defensive and, you know, yeah. I, I was, I, I've never forgotten that response of yours. So yes, I remember finding Anaveda very well. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah. and that's really, it's, I, I that's uh, something that is so uh, helpful uh, for authors, right? Is that feedback? Because otherwise we're in our own heads, right? And we don't know you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's good to get outside perspective when you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. How do you fix it? Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. So, uh, so I just wanted to thank you for that up front. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, would you, would you just uh, share your story? Uh, kind of what inspired you to become a fiction author and, uh, you know, and then how did you decide to start off as, or to start as an indie author? So sort of that journey. Yeah, of course. So I am actually a nurse. I have my bachelor's degree in nursing and I used to work as a pediatric nurse for like eight years. And then I married my husband when I was 24 or 25, but he's in the military. And so we were moving constantly for the first couple years of our life. We were like moving every six months. I should say our life together. (laughs) Um, for, for, For the first couple years of our marriage, we were moving like every six months. So I couldn't always get a job. You know, I'd moved to a different state and the licensing with nurses doesn't always carry over. You have to like license in each individual state and it just gets kind of messy. So I have been writing my whole life. I started writing, gosh, like as early as I could write. I remember writing my first story in like first grade in my journal and I had always written. It was kind of a coping mechanism for me. So I was still writing and I was taking an online creative writing class when I married my husband. And once nursing wasn't working out and that career kind of crashed, then I was like, well, maybe I'll just go into writing. So I started writing online and submitting my work into like forums and stuff. And this one novel I was writing titled Miss Mabel's School for Girls won this like little award and people loved it and wanted more. So I was really excited about it. And then someone mentioned self-publishing because I didn't really know where to go from there. I was just immersing myself in the world of agents and publishing and that kind of stuff. And someone talked about self-publishing and I was like, I've never heard of that. And this was back in like actually the heyday of self-publishing in like 2011. Uh, Yeah, it was like 2011, 2012. So anyway, I looked into it, loved it from the beginning, and just decided to go for it. I didn't even pitch to traditional. I just went straight indie from the beginning, and I love it. I've never, ever regretted that decision. I think it is such a blast. So five years later, five or six years later, here I am, uh, still indie publishing. I have 11 books under my belt, which, you know, is a fair number. A lot of indies by this time have like 30 or 40, because some people kick out like 20 books a year. But I have a son and, and, you know, life is busy. So I try and do a couple books a year. Yeah. Wow. Still a couple books a year. <laughs> Kudos. Yeah. I, yeah. I know. <laughs> two, two books is my goal with my son. Yes. Well, <laughs> like, no. Because it, I have a exactly. child. Exactly. Because family, that's, wow, that's busy too, right? So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Managing a house and a child and dogs and a husband in the military is, is you know, just part of the equation. So I just do what I can and, and you know, I'm just good with it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really good. Wow, what an inspiring journey. That's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what are, so what are your favorite fiction genres then to write in? 
Oh, so I have two, and I write them both. (laughs) Uh, Fantasy is my first love. It will always be my first love. Fantasy was definitely that place I sank into as a kid, and it was an escapist read, and I loved fantasy. Um, But I also really like uh, contemporaries. But uh, I don't necessarily write write and publish under romance, but I do chiclet, which has an element of romance. I just like I like chick lit because it has an element of like girl power in it where I can write stories about women Mm -hmm. who aren't, you know, that, that still have an element of romance, but the Mm -hmm. story is still mainly theirs. Um, although I, I love romance. I, I ghost write a lot in romance, so I'm, I'm not saying anything is romance, but I really liked chick lit's focus on the female and, and romance as a part of her life uh, in the story. So I, my favorite books to read are Chiclet and Fantasy. And I've published most in young adult fantasy, but my next series coming out will be Epic Fantasy. So that's really exciting. <laughs> wow. Because e- Epic, uh, can you just define Epic? Isn't that longer? Like, isn't yeah. that? Yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely sizably much bigger. I mean, you yeah. get people like um, Brandon Sanderson that's fa- that has 500,000 right. word manuscripts, you know. Wow. But also, Epic is, is more, there are more obligatory conventions and scenes to Epic Fantasy. Like, uh, typically there's a journey. Like, there's yeah. the hero's journey is typical in Epic Fantasy. You have more of a medieval setting. Uh, you have a broad overall world story plot moving along with, like, a character plot that kind of thing where you don't necessarily get that as much in young adult fantasy or, or other genres. Um, so I, I'm definitely trying, my projects are much bigger, much broader. They have like world issues that move along with my character issues, you know? So it's, it's been really fun to have more space to build more fantasy. (laughs) Wow. That is, that sounds really good. So would that be like, um, like I was just thinking, is that J.R.R. Tolkien kind of ish? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So like Tolkien, Hobbit. um, good. Yeah. Like, so those are all epic fantasy. They're like, yeah. they're, um, these big hero adventure kind of stories, especially where there's a big journey, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the wheel of time, Robert Jordan, uh, Brandon Sanderson does a lot of epic fantasy, you know, they're very meaty books. Yeah. <laughs> they're not really super light reads. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. that's I, not... I, mean, I, I probably won't go that big. I mean, I think my first one will probably have 150,000 words, maybe less, but still feels so big compared to my 70,000 word chiclet books. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, though. That's exciting. You can get out of control. It really can. You can over world build and, and under deliver on character and plot because yeah. there's like an addicting aspect to world building just creating whatever you want, you know, so it's, it, it's really fun. It's a good escapist kind of thing for writers. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So, <laughs> so, you know, did it take you a while to find a genre that you're passionate to write in? Like, or did, like, did you try a bunch of stuff or like? Uh, yeah, I think so. Cause I, I mean, I look back on my whole life and I've been writing since, like I said, I, I could write and I've, I just written a lot of things, but it was fantasy that I really like sink into and was like this is where I feel like I could write a lot for a long period of time and and do well so that's why it's it came fairly intuitively I mean once I started writing with the intent to publish um it was fantasy I first went to and that I stick to now so chiclet is fun but it's almost more of like a like a side thing for me where my main focus is fantasy yeah oh that's awesome so so you've had a bunch of success uh, you know, especially with your, uh, your, uh, Miss Mabel School for Girls series. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, would you just talk a little bit about that? Like, um, like that journey and, and, and then also, you know, some of the keys to success that you've had, would you, you share that with people listening? Of course. Yeah. So Miss Mabel School for Girls has done really, really well. It's a first in my series. It won the best of fantasy or outstanding fantasy in 2015. It's been a bestseller on Kindle Fantasy. It was number one in Kindle Fantasy from an awesome book bub that went really well. And um, I mean, I've moved hundreds of thousands of copies of that. It's free now. So if anyone wants to read it, you can get it for free from any ebook retailer. Um, uh, I, th- I feel like a lot of my success as an indie just comes down to dogged persistence. And I think you'll hear that from anyone. If you listen like Joanna Penn, um, anyone, it just kind of comes down to to just continuing on because I've definitely had bad months. You know, when I released Miss Mabel School for Girls, it had a fantastic launch. I sold 300 books, which I felt really good about. I mean, I was new to self-publishing, new to this. And then, you know, it did well for a little bit. And then there would be like three day spans where I didn't have any sales. And I was like devastated, like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So 
I just continued writing and publishing more books. And slowly as I published more books, like the numbers just increased and ticked up. And then I tried new strategies and I tried different lead magnets, different like ebook structures, all that kind of stuff. I just kept going with it. I just didn't give up on it. And it's, and it continues to do very well today. It's my biggest, it's my biggest seller. It's, I give away, you know, hundreds of copies of it a day. Um, it just does really well, and and I always attribute that to just to just keeping going despite you know those slump weeks where you only sell like one or two books or yeah or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's wow, that's exciting, and and I I totally get that um, persistence because you just gotta keep going even when because as writers really well anyone who's kind of doing even like a uh, creative entrepreneur side business or full-time business if you know if your goal is to go full-time um will encounter there's going to be resistance right and oh yeah <laughs> in many forms mm -hmm. right yeah and and some we may not even recognize and and that's where it's important to just continue believing in yourself and your book and and to continue on and the other part of that is just learning from what you've done before. So we sort of discussed this in your book like that I reviewed is is you kind of just have to be open yeah. to feedback because Miss Mabel's is a is a fantastic book. It's a great read. I have people who love it. I hear from fans every day, but there were still mistakes I made in that book. It wasn't perfect. None of my books were perfect. So I just had to step step away from um, my anger and defensiveness at that and say, okay, what can I learn from this and put into the next book? And, and I try and do that with every book. Like, okay, what did I learn from this book that I can move into the next one and, and collectively just progress and increase in my skill as a writer? Yeah. And I feel that's also been key to success because my books get better. Every yeah. single book I write is better than the previous one, which is the way it should be. Um, and, and I attribute that just to being able to step back from my emotions and look at it logically and say okay, I, I, maybe this story structure should have been differently or this pinch point came across too shallow or, you know, just different things that have then, my books continue to grow with me and so they're better yeah. books and my readers know that and then they trust me to continue writing good books. It's like, would you say that you have, um, I don't know, like learned through failures and mistakes in your learning curve as a writer? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know of a single indie that hasn't failed yeah. in some yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I've had plenty. So uh, Miss Mabel School for Girls, a lot of my readers felt like it was a cliffhanger ending, which I never thought it was. But then once the reviews started coming in, I was like, oh, I can kind of see they think it's a cliffhanger. And a lot of them were angry. They're like, she just did a cliffhanger, so I have to buy her second book. Now I'm not going to buy the second book. And it's like, whoa, buddy. I would, I didn't expect that at all. But then, that, but then that taught me a lot about, okay, so I maybe didn't wrap this up as well as I should have. So in the next book, I need to give more closure at the end. You know, so that was yeah. another thing. Um, I had a book launch that sold zero books. Yeah, I launched a book oh, okay. and sold zero on the first day. And that was really disappointing. It was partly my fault. My son had just been born. I didn't do a lot of ramp up. I just kind of threw it out there. So, I mean, it wasn't too surprising. But I had hoped that, you know, someone would come through for it. And it, it took a couple days for any sales to come through. And then I think it was like five. You know, so yeah. I've had book launches that just totally tanked. And I've had... Um, I've had, uh, newsletters that like just no one signs up for. Yeah. Like I'll do a lead magnet to get people to sign up for my newsletter and just no one signs up. So I did this collection of short stories, uh, from my book, Miss Mabel's. And at the end of the ebook, I say, if you want this for free, just sign up for my email list and then you'll receive updates on new books. And I had a book bub. So I did that specifically before the BookBub, launched it, sold like 5,000 copies of the book and had like 30 signups when wow. really there should have been like six to 700. Yeah. So that spectacular failure for that lead magnet. But that was great because then I said, okay, my audience didn't want this. I'm going to just offer the second book for free. So then I offered the second book and, and now I'm getting thousands of signups, you know? Yeah. So those failures are wonderful. Because yeah. I've learned so much from failing. And they're really hard in the moment. I, I remember talking to a friend, like, I'm just, this book launch didn't go well. Or this blog post was supposed to be awesome and no one is commenting mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is. 
and I try and process those emotions and then attack it from a logical side. Like, okay, well, this this lead magnet didn't work, so how can I change it? What is more value than I'm providing here? That people, what is the offer that people can't refuse? And that yeah. turned out to be the second book in the series. So now I'm I'm daily like just getting so many signups because they're getting the second book free, and I'm seeing an, an amazing buy through rate for the rest of the series. Yeah. So then I logically had this data to step back and say, okay this was the mistake and now I know in upcoming series what to do. So now I'm, I'm already prepared for the future and I can just automatically set myself up for success. But without having failed, I probably wouldn't have known that. Yeah. I guess it, it, it helps you to step back and just kind of, you know, see, okay, so obviously, you know, my audience is wanting something different. <laughs> so, and, and that's hard. Yeah. That's hard to step back and say, this didn't meet success. Yeah. I really wanted it to, but it didn't. And so sometimes I have to give myself some space to have a little pity party. Like, oh, that didn't work out the way I wanted. I'm so upset yeah. no one responded. Yeah. But then I eat some chocolate and then get, <laughs> get through it. And then, I, okay, so now how can we improve? <laughs> yeah. Sounds, sounds like what I do too. A little yep. bit of chocolate. Okay, I just need a few hours just to- you know? <laughs> exactly. I just need to drink Dr. Pepper 10 and eat some little Debbie snacks and I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, you know, and that's, that's really great that you, you know, that you pick yourself up and that you and then look back and say what, you know, okay, so, you know, where do I need to pivot, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. It's that dogged persistence. Like you just have to keep going. It's indie publishing is a long term game. There are definitely outliers that have met crazy phenomenal success, but th- those are outliers. Yeah. You just, you know, you, you need to prepare yourself to be in it for the long haul. And if you, if you hit that like winner early, awesome, but at yeah. least prepare yourself for something else. And then you won't be disappointed if, if you're just like the rest of us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, I kind of wanted to, you know, chat. We, we had kind of emailed back and forth. I wanted to chat a little bit about imposter syndrome uh, today. So have there been times where you've you struggled with that, like days, weeks, whatever, where you've struggled with that imposter syndrome, syndrome, you know, self-doubt, that sort of thing? Oh, I think it'd be easier to count the days I didn't struggle with it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they would maybe fit on one hand. <laughs> yeah, so imposter syndrome, it's just, it's this interesting thing that I, I'm hearing more and more in indie channels, like through podcasts and blog posts. And maybe I'm just more attuned to it and maybe it's already been out there, but I feel like people are talking about it more, which is really good. So imposter syndrome is basically just this feeling that you're an imposter in whatever space you're in. Yeah. So like I'm, I'm a blogger, I blog about, like indie author stuff that helps my clients that come to me is um, that my clients I mentor, I, I blog about stuff that can help them. And then I blog to my fantasy and chick lit email list also. So imposter syndrome, like in that space would be like, well, no one is going to care that I have anything to say about how to get a book bub or whatever. So that's imposter syndrome. It's like this voice in your head that is just questioning your every action toward the goal. So if you're saying, well, I really want to self-publish, imposter syndrome would then say, well, who are you to self-publish? Like, who's going to read your book? Why would anyone care about what you have to say? Which is imposter syndrome. Because you believe that you're an imposter in this space. The tough thing about imposter syndrome is that it grows with you. So even as you like grow into your career, imposter syndrome is going to follow you. Joanna Penn had a podcast recently that said there's always there's always someone above you. Mm-hmm. So even like if you're brand new to self-publishing and, and we'll use Joanna as an example, you're like, oh, I want to be like Joanna Penn one day. Well, Joanna Penn is Joanna Penn and she's still like, oh, there's still people above her that she wants to be like. So you can get to a place of great influence in a space where you are an authority and you're still going to struggle with imposter syndrome that still says you're an imposter here. And imposter syndrome also is just this feeling that at any moment, someone's going to like pull back the curtain and say, you don't belong here or you're a fraud or whatever. So imposter syndrome just snakes into everything. It's, it's really tricky because oftentimes we don't even hear it in our own head, but it's affecting the way we approach our career. So I, um, I do a lot of freelancing. Sometimes I do ghostwriting. I have freelance clients that just want to write a book, but they need help. Yeah. And so I, I'll like come in and help them with their story structure or they'll write a scene and I'll amp it up or, you know, different things like that. And, um, I've noticed I can, I can, pinpoint imposter syndrome 
in clients before I've even talked to them. So I have this one client that's an author that I, I'm his business manager. And I was looking at his old website and I said, you struggle with imposter syndrome, don't you? And he's like, oh yeah, I don't even think I should be here. Like, I don't even have a degree in all this stuff, but I've been teaching it for like 10 years or whatever. And I could tell that he struggled with imposter syndrome simply by the way he laid out his website because he was giving away everything for free. Like he was afraid to charge any money for anything. Um, he had all of this stuff like, well, no one's going to buy this. So I'm just giving it away. Yeah. And it's like, but people will buy this. They will put money into you because you provide value. And he just didn't know the value he provided. And I, I, uh, I get a lot of emails. I'm subscribed to a lot of newsletters because I like to track what's going on in the industry, but also in blogs outside of writing, mm -hmm. just to kind of see how industries outside of writing are, are doing like e-commerce and, and newsletters and that kind of stuff. So there was this one blog I was following and she's a mommy blogger. And she was offering a new course or some sort of product. And she... <laughs> in this email accidentally forgot to put a link to her new course. So she sent a quick follow-up email that said, I am so, 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 so sorry. I, I really want you to sign up for this course. I just forgot to put the link. Please don't think I'm doing this to get money. I just really like want to bring you this content and, and I'm trying to be genuine. And she was like, falling over herself apologizing when all she did was forget to put a link I mean we've all done that like oh crap sorry forgot to send the link here's a follow-up <laughs> you know yeah. baby brain whatever but she just was like terrified that people would think oh she's just in this for money and it's like well what's wrong if you're in it for money we all have to have money yeah. you know we all have to live but imposter syndrome is that voice in those heads that's saying you don't deserve to be here and no one's going to listen to you. And it, we start listening to it and it starts affecting the way we do things. And that can actually break our trust with our readers. So like that blogger, I didn't sign up for her course because I was like, she's, she seems like she's not in a great place right now. You know, like she's yeah. just kind of a frantic mess. Yeah. And it kind of broke my trust. Like, I don't know if she can provide great content to me if she's like not even sure herself that it's great content. So I didn't sign up for her course. But I, I that stuck with me because I was like, how am I self-sabotaging myself in my own newsletters or my blog posts or whatever else there is? And it can creep up in little ways. Like on your blog, for example, I was afraid to put a subscription banner at the end of my post because I didn't want people to think I was pushing too hard to get them on my email list. But then I was like, well, I don't, I don't want to be a burden to these guys. I don't want to be annoying. So I'm not going to put that there. I'm just going to have one little place for them to find it. But then I was like, wait, I need to go back and dissect that. And so I started paying attention to my own habits. And I noticed that I loved it when people put subscription boxes at the bottom of blog posts because then I knew exactly how to like sign up for them. It was just right there for me. It yeah. was really convenient. And when I didn't want to sign up, I didn't care. I just ignored it. Like, yeah. It wasn't a big deal. So I realized I'm like, oh, that is an imposter syndrome thought that's affecting the way I do my business. So I started putting, you know, the subscription box at the bottom of my posts and have yeah. seen like an increase in subscribers since then. So imposter syndrome is just kind of a scary place to go also because it it's really like bringing to light all of our insecurities is basically yeah. what it yeah. is, you know like we're and and we feel imposter I feel imposter syndrome in my marriage yeah sometimes I'm like why is my husband married to me like what can I bring into this marriage that that he couldn't get from someone else you know yeah, yeah. so it just it it crops up everywhere which can be kind of a very dangerous thing if, if we feed into it yeah what are ways, I guess, that, um, that I guess, writers specifically can become aware when they are self, you know, sabotaging. Are there specific things that they can be aware of in themselves? Oh, of course. Yeah. So this is going to sound really funky, but bear with me. If you, so this is a sign that imposter syndrome is affecting your career. If you are never in a place of stress over your career, which doesn't really make sense at first, but you know, imposter syndrome comes up when you take risks the most. Yeah. So when you're about to take a risk in your career, that's when imposter syndrome is going to wham you hard. Like yeah. you don't deserve to do this. This isn't going to work. No one's going to buy that kind of thing. So that's when you discomfort is actually a good thing because if you're like, Ooh, this is uncomfortable. So when I launched my mentor services, when I said, okay, I was already helping a lot of indie authors, but it was taking up so much of my time. I was like, you know, what? I really need to get paid for this. Cause yeah. again, I was struggling from imposter syndrome. I'm like, I want to help these guys, but they would never pay me 
but when I approached them, I'm like, hey, can we do this on like a money, like like a payment option? They're like, yes, I would feel so much better if I could pay you for your time. I was like, yeah. what? <laughs> anyway, um, when I launched that, I was sick to my stomach. Just like, oh, this is, no one is going to sign up. Like, no one's going to want to work with me. I don't know how to do this. I was really scared. I was really nervous. And I I almost quit the whole thing because, like, you know what? This isn't worth it. It's no one's going to respond. But I heard I heard that thought in my head before I even knew I was saying it. And I, and I thought, oh, no, that's imposter syndrome. Yeah. And there have been other points in my career when I'm like, this isn't a good idea. I just, this isn't safe is basically what it comes down to. So when I feel that, like, discomfort, that anxiety of I'm going to fail, then that's when I know I need to move forward. And you kind of have to do that yeah. carefully because you might have your instincts telling you like, no, this is really stupid. You should not do this. <laughs> so, you know, you need to like be able to kind of logically step back and say, this is a good reason here and here. And I'm afraid because of I might fail or I'm afraid because of X, Y, Z and, you know, kind of analyze it out. But that feeling of discomfort is a sign to you that um, you're afraid because you're taking a chance and amazing things happen because you take chances. Like the universe, God, whoever, it can't bless you mm-hmm. unless you're going to put yourself out there, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing, there's a book uh, by, oh shoot, I just lost her name because I knew I was about to say it. Um, it's called, oh, Tara Moore. Tara Moore, M-O-H-R. Oh. It's called Playing Big by Tara Moore. And it's written for women, but the the stuff is applicable to men. It's just specifically addresses women who struggle with imposter syndrome in the workplace in any career level because women tend to struggle with it more just because of the dynamics of women versus men kind of thing. But that is a fantastic resource for anyone that struggles with imposter syndrome because she really breaks it down. And in the book, she gives ways of combating it. And I'll I'll go through a few that Tara gives. But if you want to read more in depth, that's just a stunning book that I would would recommend anyone. And one thing she suggests that I found so helpful was to, um, it sounds funny, make a caricature of your inner voice. So what she explains is that this imposter syndrome comes from this inner voice that is just trying to like save us from heartache. So it's a part of us, like it's just a part of us that's on the defense that's like, whoa, you're going to be in pain and disappointed if you take this chance. Let's just scale back. So it's it's a part of us that's trying to protect ourselves. So she suggested that you put a caricature to him, like make it a grumpy, frumpy old cat lady with a bun and a raggedy old robe that like walks around snapping all day, you know, kind of make something amusing out of it. Like maybe for some women, it's their mom, honestly, (laughs) you know, like that inner voice is their mom or their husband or themselves, you know, but if you can make this like caricature of it, then you can start identifying it better. So when those thoughts come which we don't always even recognize, when those thoughts come, we can then picture this frumpy old cat lady with a ratted old newspaper hitting everyone. And she's saying, don't do that. Like, no one's going to listen to you. And then you can just say, because you don't want to fight with her, right? Because you're fighting with yourself, basically. Yeah. Like, this is a piece of you that's trying to protect you. So what Tara Moore suggests is that you just say, I understand your concern, but I got this. Like, yes, there's a chance I'm going to fail. But I have done all the research I need to do, and I feel like I'm in control of this. Or, you know, just kindly say, I hear you, I understand, I'm doing it anyway. And then move forward. And that's almost like an an affirmation that just kind of gives you power. That's good, yeah. You know, it kind of gives you that, you have a chance, an opportunity to say, I understand I can fail, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to try anyway. And that is kind of an empowering phrase to be able to say to yourself, like, there's a chance this doesn't go well, but I'm going to try anyway. I've got this. And yeah. then you can, you know, move forward with, with greater confidence. And I have tried that. Um, and I like it. You know, for me, it works. Some people might be a little too woo-woo, you know, like <laughs> therapy-driven or something, <laughs> which it's not. But, you know, for some people, it might feel that way. So for those people, I would just recommend you start listening because the imposter syndrome thoughts come so naturally. We normally don't even recognize they're there. Or they're more of just like a feeling than like actual phrase. So maybe we're not saying to ourselves, I'm going to fail, but we just are like, oh, this is not going to go well. Or, you know, like there's different phraseology for it. So we don't recognize it for what it is. So I would say for those people who don't want to make a caricature of their their grumpy old lady, 
is to just start listening to your thoughts and just hear what you're saying to yourself and then counteract from there. So I shouldn't self-publish this book because no one's going to read it. Like, maybe no one will read it. I don't control that. But I'm going to do it anyway because I think people will read it. And then you, you know, you move on. So the other thing about that is, like I said, imposter syndrome grows with you. So it's helpful to have these keys to manage it, but these don't, doesn't wipe this away, right? So we always have this part of us that's going to try and defend us. But I have noticed that it has dramatically lessened the the fear and anxiety I feel towards like new things that I'm moving toward. Yeah. Wow. That's really helpful. And, <laughs> and you're right. I mean, it just shows up. Uh, it, and especially when you're about to take a risk is actually, that's when I've noticed it. <laughs> <It's, Yeah. laughs> right? On something like publish a mm-hmm. book. Or, you know, or step out into something new. Yeah, start a podcast. Start a podcast. I'm sure there was like, well, who's going to listen to me? And I'm in over my head on this. I can't do it. Or this is too much. And and sometimes that's true. Yeah. But when these thoughts are leading you to not take action or to stop your career, then that's when it's becoming a toxic thing that you just kind of need to address. So you don't unknowingly self-sabotage yourself through whatever means, you know? Yeah. No, I, I, I remember actually that fear, especially when I wanted to start a podcast. And then my husband was so helpful. He said, okay, just think of like, what's the worst? And I said, well, okay, the worst is that I have a bunch of people saying no. He said, well, if that's the worst, you know, do it anyway. <laughs> and I thought, well, I guess that's true. You know, it's not yeah. like they're going to pummel me. It's just, they'll say yeah. no. You know, that so. <laughs> that's very powerful, too, is yeah. to play the situation out to its like logical worst end. Yeah. And I doubt for most things it's like the world is going to blow up if I do this. You know, what I mean, like it's yeah. not <laughs> like the stakes maybe aren't as high as we think. So it's like, well, I'm going to self-publish this book. And what if no one reads it? Then no one reads it. And you spent some time on it that you feel maybe wasted. But if you keep going, eventually you'll find that audience, you know, yeah. so if you can play the situation out to its like logical demise or like the worst possible path it can take, that can also kind of lessen that idea or just give you something to say back to the imposter syndrome. Like, yeah, well, you'll be rejected. Yeah, but I won't die. You know, like, yeah, well, that's true. Right. So <laughs> rejected, I won't die. So it's like, it's not like I'm going to lose my house. Yeah. You know, so yeah, sometimes that puts it on a scale that kind of puts it in perspective and we can say, oh, Okay, yeah, so maybe it's not as big a risk as I thought, and the, and you can push forward. Tara Moore in her book actually suggests that you um, should be taking risks. I think I think she said this might be someone else because I've studied this a little bit. Um, you should at least once a week or once a month try and feel uncomfortable because you're taking risks. Wow. And like moving forward yeah. in yeah. your career. And I think that uncomfortable feeling will always be there. Um, though I just don't think its power over us will be as great as we continue to address it. Yeah. What are steps, I guess, that you take to work through, you know, each day, I guess, as you write and self-publish your books and you have many other things on the go too. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so like just in general or to like lessen the imposter syndrome? Uh, yeah, maybe to lessen the imp- imposter syndrome. But but I mean, you did mention, you know, perseverance. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, to inspire yourself, to motivate yourself and then to, oh, yeah. you know, to be aware of imposter system, syndrome and all that. So for me, um, self-awareness is just a big key, which it doesn't always happen. And self-awareness for me just means being present in the moment. Yeah. So it's really easy, especially in self-publishing, because we have so many balls in the air. Like yeah. there's cover design and there's uploading and there's podcasting and there's emails and there's <laughs> writing and there's all this stuff. It's easy to like live in the future for me to say, I have to do all of these things by the end of the day. I have to do all of these things by the end of the week. Oh, I didn't do this. But what I have found is when I future live, um, everything is more difficult, everything. And that's when I start to feel anxiety of, I can't do all this. Like, this isn't going to work out. No one is going to read this stuff anyway. Why am I pushing forward? But if I can just be in the moment and say, right now, my priority is writing on my Dragon Masters book. So I'm gonna set a timer and for an hour and I'm not gonna do anything else for that hour. Yeah. And then I just write. So that that kind of helps me just put away all the future living so I can just kind of live in that moment. And then every every night before I go to bed, I have I have a little planner. It's a disaster. I can show it to you. It's right here. It's always with me. Um, it's a mess. I'm not super organized. So it's like 
a total disaster. Oh, okay, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I sit down at the end of a day and I go to the next day and I say, my priorities are these. So I make a small list of priorities because I have clients and, and like mentor calls and, and my own writing and then yes. my own business running. And then I manage this other account. So I make a list of priorities and I say, this is what has to be done tomorrow. And this is what I would like to be done tomorrow. And then when I wake up the next day, my schedule changes every single day because my husband's in grad school and I have a toddler and we live in the mountains. So <laughs> um, that's why the day before I, I don't like detail plan like too far ahead. I just kind of do the day before I'll have a general plan. Like I, you know, recording a podcast here or releasing a book here, but I detail plan just the day before. And then in the morning I say, okay, this is how I'm going to lay it out at nap time. I'm going to do these three projects. And then after bedtime, I'm going to do these three and I'm going to fit all in like this. So that's kind of how I manage it. Just the writing and self-publishing aspect of it. And then my husband only has class Monday, Wednesday, Friday right now. So he gives me Tuesdays and Thursdays to work and he takes to our son. So we, that's how we just manage it on like a day-to-day basis. But in terms of like imposter syndrome, managing that on a day-to-day basis, actually, there's this one thing I've tried that I really like. So I love Brandon Sanderson's work. I love um, Libba Bray, Gaylene Foley. Like, there's so many authors that I love and track and read constantly. And so what I do is I'm, I'm signed up for their newsletter so I can track how they contact, like, their people. But <laughs> what I do is I pretend that I'm them every single time I interact with my audience. Wow. So in that, I mean, okay, I am Brandon Sanderson, and everybody wants this information I'm going to give because they love my books, and they're tracking me as an author. And that's like what I say in my head when I'm writing out a newsletter. Because I'm like, why does anyone care what progress I've made on the next book? Um, I mean, I, I have thousands of people on my list that have chosen to be there. But still, I hear myself saying, oh, they don't really want this information. But I am making a choice for them that's not mine to make. If they don't want that information, they can unsubscribe. But I need to give them the opportunity to have it. So I tell myself, I am Brandon Sanderson, and everybody really wants this information as much as I want information about him and what's going on with his projects and his life, you know? Yeah. That has really helped because it takes me out of my mindset and puts me into the reader. Like, okay, I'm a reader of Brandon Sanderson. What do I want to hear from him in his monthly newsletters? So how can I give that to my readers and pretend that I am Brandon Sanderson and and move forward that way? And that kind of shucks off that, like, imposter syndrome. They don't want to hear from me. What I have to say isn't worth anything because then I tell myself, Brandon Sanderson's updates are worthy to me. Like, you know, I, I love hearing from him. And I signed up to his news list the way these people signed up to mine. So I need to give them this and act as if I'm this person. Yeah. So that, that has helped a lot too. And then engaging my audience has also helped. Like giving them opportunities to interact with me, whether it's like through giveaways on Instagram or I do polls in my newsletters or just asking them questions and saying, hit reply, I'll respond personally, anything like that also helps because then I hear from these people and they're like, oh, I love your books or thank you for this opportunity or blah, blah, blah. And that reaffirms to me, there are people that want to hear from me. And I keep all of those in a separate folder in my email account that says motivation from fans. And Mm -hmm. when the imposter syndrome is getting really bad, I just go there and I scroll through all the emails that I get like, okay, these people loved my book. To them, I am Brandon Sanderson and I need to supply as if I was Brandon Sanderson. Uh, so that is something that's helped me on a day-to-day basis to just kind of keep going. Yeah, that is, I never, I would never have thought of that. That's a great idea. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> it, it puts your mind in a different spot, you know, exactly. in, in a positive um, perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it takes you out of your mind into your reader's mind. Yeah. And we're here to serve the reader, right? Yes. So that helps me serve them, but also facilitate belief in myself of they want to hear from me and and it's positive affirmations it's basically all it is it's positive affirmations that help silence or push aside that voice of fear that is just saying they don't what if they reject us and again if you play that out to its logical conclusion worst case scenario is they unsubscribe yeah but even then if they unsubscribe that's great because they weren't your audience then yeah so now you're just Every time I have an unsubscribe, a little piece of me is like, oh, oh, no, that's that hurts a little. But then I say, no, this is great because now I'm actually finding my audience. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. That's good. Um, anyway, so that's that's a, a way that's daily helped me. So Yeah. 
That's awesome. Uh, so just as we as we kind of you know come come to the end of our chat, um, would you uh, just share some you know your top three sort of pieces of advice or tips for indie authors, you know whose goal is to make um, a, a part time or full time living as an indie author? So my first one is what I said earlier is just dogged determination. Yeah. Just keep going. Um, my second, well, well it kind of goes with that, so I'll keep it with number one, is just keep going and set realistic expectations. So plan on this taking several years to really make you money. Yeah. Uh, my second one is to always uh, love the reason you're doing this. So the self-publishing podcast, like John, or Sean calls it, know your why, basically. Yeah. Know why you're doing this. Yeah. Like, why are you writing fantasy? Why are you, like, publishing a nonfiction book to help authors? Why are you starting a podcast? And then cling to that if you need to, to, to keep going. I, I think knowing why you're doing this and having that goal yeah. is, is key to success. Yeah. And then my third one is to write down yearly goals. And, and honestly, I, I would say write down goals probably every day. A lot of the clients that I mentor – they come to me for help with like launching their book or starting their newsletter, or whatever it is that they want. And I say, okay, well, what's your goal? And every single one of them's like, uh, I don't, I don't know. Like, <laughs> is your goal to like make a thousand sales? Is your goal to just get the book out there? So if you can define your goals, it gives you something to work toward yeah. that is tangible. So then when you meet the goal and you get there, it just feels really good. Like, oh, I met this goal. But even if you don't meet that goal for a while, you're working towards something instead of, just working. It, yeah. it gives you like direction and focus. Jeff Goins did an article about how setting a goal like um, changed his life. Like he, he did an article with this guy basically set a goal to make $100,000 and he did it within a year. Yeah. And he said, I would never have done it if I didn't have a goal to chase. So that's the first thing I work with with my clients is what's your goal and what's your why? Yeah. And then go after them. Yeah. That goals aren't set in stone either. Yeah. You know, so maybe like your goal is I'm going to make $10,000 by the end of the year. Well, maybe you make $10,000 within three months. So it's like, okay, I'm going to make $30,000 by the end of the year or whatever. Or maybe you only make 8000 It's like, well, that goal didn't really come to pass, but you can still keep it going. You know, so maybe it just takes longer. So be flexible, but have the goal. Yeah. And, and, it, uh, and you can like work with it because maybe you have a baby and all your goals have to change, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's been <to> me. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's just important that you start making them. Yeah. Well, uh, Katie, so much great advice <laughs> today. <laughs> I'm glad it's helpful. Uh, I'll have to re-listen. <laughs> uh, so, um, would you share, you know, what books, projects you've got on the go right now and then where people, uh, can find your, you and your books online? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, I'm working on my epic fantasy right now and that's super exciting. It's called the dragon masters. It's about witches and dragons in the medieval time setting. It's, it's all epic fantasy. It's going to be so fun. It's a duology. So I'm doing the first book and I'll have the both books available within three weeks of each other, hopefully next year, hopefully. Um, and you can find me at kcrosswriting.com. It's just kcrosswriting.com. And there you can get my first fantasy book for free or the first book in my Chicklet series. You can get both of them free. And then if you sign up to my mailing list, you can get the second book in both series free. And if you want to work with me, I still have some mentor slots available. Just there's a work with me tab. Just hit that. It's, I have like freelancing, ghostwriting, and, and then the indie mentor work that I do. So sometimes that's just as simple as like a one-time session to maybe help plan a launch. But I also have like recurring clients that come back every month that just say we set goals. We talk about their, their struggles and their questions and their writing. They might send me a sample of their writing and we'll go through, you know, how to improve it or send me a sample outline and we'll talk about the three-act structure uh, so there's all that information is there if anyone's interested. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds yeah. great. So fun. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Katie. This has been yeah. such a blast to chat with you. I've learned so much. Yes. So, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure people listening are just, you know, they'll have to re-listen too to, <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> you know, so, to, to learn all your great tips. So thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. <laughs>